All right, uh, good morning. Um, I probably ought to say something about Penox, first of all, uh, which is the uh, company I'm chairman of. Penox is the world's, or at least we think we're the world's, the largest producer of lead oxide, which is used in car batteries. Uh, it is, of course, possible by now that someone in China is far bigger than us, but we don't know that yet. And uh, amongst our uh, great sales recently has been some to the Australian Navy, which has been used in uh, submarine batteries. So, so uh, we make it in Barcelona and ship it over here. So what I'm going to talk to about today is Gibson's paradox, and uh, this is a, a historical uh, anomaly in the field of uh, economics, which uh, uh, was apparently solved uh, some uh, 25 years ago, um, and you will see that the solution includes the name Summers, uh, Lawrence Summers, who was the U.S. Treasury Secretary and uh, is associated a lot, I think, in some quarters with uh, efforts to suppress the price of gold. So um, it's quite a dry subject, I'm afraid, um, and uh, it's difficult to make it interesting, but uh, I'll do what I can to uh, alleviate the difficulty. Um, Oh dear, no, sorry, that shouldn't be in this. Uh, this that's another Gibson and another paradox. Uh, we'll pass on that one, I think. I don't think I could uh, really offer much help there. Okay. So, what is Gibson's paradox? Um, and it's this simple statement. Uh, all the way through this presentation, by the way, I shall refer to Baskin Summers, August 1985, and that is the paper that was published uh, by Professor Baskin Summers, um, which I think is held by certainly all of the mainstream Keynes economists as uh, having you know, solved the paradox. And so it's the fact that the observation that the price level and the nominal interest rate were positively correlated over long periods of economic activity. Now, what does that actually mean? And I think a graph probably solves it better. And this is uh, a graph from the paper, and it's under a gold standard. And uh, the solid line is a world price index, and the dotted line is a consolidated yield. And as you can see, they follow each other relatively comfortably. And if we move away from the period of a gold standard, when there's no gold standard, you can see perhaps a slightly more complicated graph, but I think the key thing to see, this is the price um, level tootling off up there and interest rates going, so they're not following each other at all. And those of you who have been used to doing things like budgeting and uh, other exotic things in the last few years will know that most interest rates, the way you think of an interest rate is a real rate with an inflation premium on top. As we'll see in a minute, during the gold standard, period, that didn't really happen. So here's the history of the paradox. Um, Keynes named the paradox after a chap called A.H. Gibson, who was an actuary, and uh, to those of you who do not know, um, actuaries are people who found accountancy too exciting. So it was obviously, uh, uh, you know, um, a very good thing to spend your life on, I'm sure. Uh, several attempts were made to resolve it uh, by a number of leading economists uh, uh, over the 50 years. And Baskin Summers' paper, which as I've mentioned before, Gibson's Paradox and the Gold Standard, published in 1985. And I think there's general acceptance that it provided the solution. Uh, I hope that's legible, but this is off the front of the paper. And uh, I wouldn't pretend to follow the sort of um, economic hierarchy in the US uh, particularly closely, but I think that's probably a list of the great and good of uh, the US. And you might notice on here, I think it's the fourth line, that the Federal Reserve also uh, were involved in looking at this paper, which, given what I'm going to talk about later, you may find interesting. So I think this is probably the most difficult part, this little bit here, so uh, hopefully I'll manage to uh, explain it. Uh, when you have a gold standard, what actually happens is the government, monetary authority, central bank, whoever, uh, it pegs the currency to a nominal gold price. So, I mean, given where the gold price is today, you know, you might say, well, a dollar is worth, uh, you peg it to the dollar, $1,500 uh, $1, an ounce, whatever. Um, and that would be uh, the, the setting, the basis for the standard. 
Now, if, the key thing here is if the price level, and again I put the CPI in the, uh, the US measure, if the price level goes up, then effectively an ounce of gold buys less goods, and the price level goes down, obviously the gold buys more. And the price level effectively moves as a reciprocal, I won over, if you can remember your school mass, uh, of the gold price. And this is really the whole thing, this is the one intellectual point, if you like, that you, if you grasp that you should better understand the rest of it. And what happened to the price level under a gold standard? This is straight out of the paper. The price level under the gold standard nearly followed a random walk. So there wasn't this inflation bias pushing prices up all the time. It actually moved around. Uh, sometimes for all sorts of reasons prices would fall, sometimes they would rise. But the key thing, and I think this point is sometimes forgotten, the price level during the gold standard years was anything but stable and it dodged around all over the place. And that perhaps isn't surprising if you think back to the times when we had the, uh, you know, the oil price explosions uh, and so forth. If something like that happens in the economy, it's likely that the price level will vary. So the gold standard doesn't really promise price stability, and that's quite an important thing to uh, just remember. Now what happened to interest rates under a gold standard? Remember interest rates were correlated to the price level, we discussed that already, it's one of the things they poofed around and we've also mentioned that the price level moved randomly. And this really means that nominal interest rates had no inflation premium. I've rather made the point already but it's an important point. If you think of uh, you know, you know, interest rates today straight the inflation premium. But during the gold standard there was no inflation premium. And I would argue that meant the gold standard actually worked rather well and anchored the monetary system really, you know, rather well. And Professor Summers himself has said so. So also recall that the price level was a reciprocal of the gold price. We discussed that earlier. So it means that interest rates were inversely correlated to the price level. I, the reciprocal one over varies with the, uh, to the gold price. Right, Barsky and Summers tested their conclusions after the gold standard period and concluded that there is an inverse relationship between the real interest rate and the real gold price. And this is the nub of the whole thing. This is the nub of the Gibson's paradox. Uh, and effectively, uh, this is the thing that people who believe in gold price suppression uh, concentrate on. Right, they developed a, mathemat a mathematical model and they actually set up an equation where they claimed that it worked between the real gold price and interest rates. So you could set up gold price and work out what the interest rate should be. Uh, you could set an interest rate and work out what the gold price should be. So they set this up. It's rather a complicated equation. I didn't think it was appropriate to put it in here, mainly because I didn't understand it. But uh, it, it, the work has been done. Also, interestingly, they concluded that a similar relationship existed between other metals and real interest rates. And now we'll show a couple more graphs, which I think illustrate the point better than any words from me. So, this is the gold price and real interest rates, and the log of the inverse of the, the price of the moving. You can say the correlation perhaps isn't brilliant, but it's obviously there to the eye. And here it is with non-ferrous metals arguably looks better actually than the gold during that period but that's again from their from their uh, work now let's move on that's really the end of the theory and talk about what this may or may not mean um, in terms of uh, gold investors now uh, there's an organization called GATA which some of you will no doubt know about some of you may um, think they're nuts or you may actually uh, uh, agree with what they write about but they're effectively the people who've been pushing the idea of uh, gold price being suppressed. And Reg Howe works as a consultant for them, also runs his own gold site called the Golden Sextant. And I think it was fair to say that he published a paper in August 2001 which probably identified the fact that the work done by Summers on Gibson's paradox opened up a theoretical reason for why somebody might suppress gold prices. And why may they, might they suppress gold prices? To reduce interest rates. Okay. If you go back and read Keynes's original work, uh, towards the end of it, you will find a long section on how it is the duty of the authorities to keep interest rates as low as possible, consistent with full unemployment. So it was a Keynesian objective to keep interest rates low. 
I would strongly urge you, if you're interested in what I'm talking about here, to actually read the paper by, by Reg Howe. I think it's an extremely uh, good paper. And uh, the last point on the slide, his analysis shows that a divergence started between the theoretical model that Summers and Barsky had uh, formed, and really that is his, in his view when gold price suppression by the authorities really started uh, when Mr. Clinton was in the White House. So we've already talked slightly about this, but why might the authorities suppress the gold price? Obviously, it reduces real interest rates. Uh, I think some of you will probably have heard of a gentleman called John Williams who publishes um, a website in the US called Shadow Statistics and he has held for I think the last 20 to 30 years that the US measure of the CPI uh, is completely understated and that if you use the same statistical techniques that were used in the 1960s you'd come out with a much higher rate of inflation in the US than they currently show. Um, clearly, if you've got real, the uh, real interest rates being suppressed, also false information coming out to the market about inflation rates, then nominal interest rates are clearly going to uh, be lower than they might otherwise be. And I make this point here at the bottom of the slide that Keynes himself believed that interest rates should be kept low enough to allow full unemployment. Now, this is perhaps more interesting. Um, and we'll talk about the Bank for International Settlements in a minute. But uh, it, uh, amongst this other uh, work, it publishes a lot of uh, financial papers, which are all available on the website. And they have been publishing a number of them since the crisis, the financial crisis, came. And I um, particularly point you towards BIS paper 51. Um, Yes, it, you do have to be a bit of a nerd to read these things, but it is quite interesting. And basically, two of the main papers in there, and Philip Turner is a gentleman who works for the BIS, they are starting to come to the view that the financial crisis may have been caused by the fact that interest rates did not rise properly to recognize the risks of what was going on in the underlying economy. Now, it could be, therefore... And I'm not saying I, I, I'm simply uh, not competent to, uh, uh, and certainly don't have the ego to stand up here and suggest that this is the answer. But it's possible, it's possible that gold price suppression is one of the reasons for the crisis. And it's something that I think as time passes and, uh, you know, I think mainstream economists tend to catch up with what's been going on. It'll be interesting to see what, ha what comes out about it. But it's an interesting coincidence, isn't it? Now, what is the evidence for gold price suppression? I mean, there's plenty of it. I I'd encourage everyone to form their own opinion. Uh, I clearly have, uh, by standing up here and making this talk, I've clearly formed mine. But that doesn't mean I'm right, of course. And I'd encourage any of you who find any of this interesting to go to the website of GATA. Um, Chris Powell, who runs it, I think is an excellent chap. And uh, there are some very strong arguments there, uh, apart, from, apart from the rhetoric that you may occasionally see coming out from them, which is often very harsh and quite personal. But if you actually uh, go and look at uh, what's, uh, what's on the website, there's some interesting things to read about. Uh, the typical trading patterns in gold. Uh, there's some studies by various consultants, Frank Veneroso, Reg Howe, I've mentioned already, and James Turk. And also, uh, Rudy earlier mentioned silver, and as you know, it's reasonably topical at the moment. Uh, a gentleman called Ted Butler has published an awful lot of things on silver, has predict been predicting for a number of years that the silver price would rise and that it is being suppressed for reasons that I don't think he's ever particularly gone into. And we have the uh, interesting development uh, in the last few weeks when one of the commissioners of the CFTC, uh, Mr. Chilton, uh, has made some remarks regarding illegal silver futures trading and uh, indeed I believe uh, three or four legal actions have now commenced against uh, certain banks. Um, I think it'll be terribly interesting to see what comes out of that but there's an awful lot there to take in and if any of you wish to look at it I would encourage you to form your own opinion and go and look at it. Any of this stuff, I think, is uh, worth reading. So, as we said, 
you've got to form your own conclusions. You've got to look at what this Gibson paradox really is. I mean, Gibson paradox is really you know, the fact that the interest rates in gold have a link. I would urge you to read critically anything and have a look at it. And you also need to perhaps consider the track record of some of their parties. Um, the Harvard Endowment Fund, while Mr. Summers was in charge, I think rather collapsed. And I'm vaguely reminded of the remark um, by Mae West, um, who said, I was snow white, but I drifted. Yeah. And I think that uh, perhaps Mr. Summers himself uh, may want to uh, say yes to that. Now, well, I think one of the reasons Marcus asked me to sort of talk about this is he was aware that I'd also been doing a little bit of work on my own. Um, I don't think I mentioned at the beginning, it's probably because uh, it's something I'm not terribly proud of in one sense, but I am a chartered accountant. And uh, one of the things that I probably can do reasonably well is read a set of accounts. And I saw an opportunity to do some work of my own earlier this year. Uh, a number of you will be aware that um, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, um, uh, caused some controversy when their annual report for 2009-2010 was published because of gold swaps. There were some rather large gold swaps and there was a lot of publicity about it. So I actually thought I'd sit down and work through it carefully. Um, you know, it took me quite a long time because I do have a few other things to do apart from read accounts. And uh, it took me quite a long time to do this. But for me it was quite valuable because it actually uh, reinforced my own view that there is something to all this suppression talk that's going on. Um, the way the BIS put their accounts together is, uh, I think probably it's polite to say obscure. Uh, I don't know whether I can really convey this very easily um, in this talk. Um, some of it is quite technical, frankly. But we are, um, or symposium are going to, I think, have available on the website uh, the paper that I wrote on this. It's very long and very tedious, I'm afraid, but if particularly if any of you are accountants, I'd be delighted for someone to read it and tell me whether I've got it right or wrong. But uh, anyway, I would encourage you to have a look at it. Um, so the BRS um, operate two things. Uh, they have these two types of accounts, and they're called gold site accounts and gold earmarked accounts. And effectively, one is unallocated gold and one is allocated gold. Now, they refer to these in the uh, annual report and accounts, but they actually don't define them, which, if a public company did that, I think they'd be rightly um, criticised by somebody, probably the press. And so that in itself is a, an interesting point of view. And in fact, to find out what gold site and gold earmarked accounts were, I had to find a rather obscure document published in 1997 by the BIS, which was published as a result of um, them coming under pressure to repatriate gold to um, uh, Jewish people who had had it stolen by the Nazis. So uh, it's an interesting... Um, you know, way that that whole research, you know, threw some light onto what they were doing. Uh, they also did have the good grace to confirm to me by email eventually that uh, the definitions in those documents were the ones that still apply. But anyway, if you want to have a look into it, it's quite interesting, and I'm going to summarise some of the conclusions now. But as you can see, there, there's rather a lot of gold held by the BIS. It's also quite striking that the vast majority of it is held on an unallocated basis. Um, and that is, I think, uh, if we uh, you know, slip it into a slightly colloquial language, it's probably closer to paper gold than earmarked accounts are. So it's very, very interesting that the, that the gold market now, in terms of the BIS's activity, is very much featured around site accounts. If you read back into the 1930s when it first started, the vast majority of gold was actually held in earmarked accounts on an allocated basis. So, see if I can summarise um, what I've said. I should probably repeat some of what I've said already, but here we are. So the BIS, it doesn't define the gold site accounts and gold earmarked accounts, uh, but mentions them. Um, crazy, really. I mean, you know, you, you should really define anything that you put into a set of accounts. 
um, that use the most obscure accounting definitions to describe their gold assets and liabilities. There are about six accounting notes that try and describe it and trying to work out what it means it took me about two months. And they do not use the same accounting rules as other central banks for the gold assets and liabilities. Um, on the web, you can find a note from the Bank of Japan explaining how some gold moved between earmarked and site accounts and what it meant. The BIS do not use the same rules as the Bank of Japan. Uh, strange, but they don't. Okay, so the unallocated gold held by the BIS um, is treated as if it was physical gold. As I said here, no other central bank uses this approach, and in fact it would be deemed as a debtor in the accounts, not as physical gold. The other thing, and the thing that got me into looking at this, was the recent big gold swaps in, uh, involving the BIS. And uh, at the head of the BIS gave an interview to, I think it was the Financial Times, and uh, the words are chosen quite carefully. And uh, he says the activities fall within their normal commercial remit. I'm sure that is correct. Um, and the implication of his words, I think, is, or, or are, the implications are, that um, this is something that isn't unusual. Yet, if you go back through the account, it is. Nothing like this has happened for a long time in this size. So a little bit of... Um, perhaps dubious um, wordsmithing there by the head. Okay. The swap actually does allow double counting of gold by official agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, not terribly good, really. It doesn't, I think, reflect very well on the, uh, on the official sector. Also in 2010, there's an extremely large increase. I think it's 42%. I know it's on the next slide, so we'll see if my memory is any good in a second. Um, in the level of unallocated gold held by the BIS, but no explanation for a 42% increase in an asset class is provided. Uh, again, if it was a public company, it would probably be criticised, rightly so, for not commenting on this. So, just to sum up, I think the following points are clear. The BIS, the BIS deliberately, uh, it's got to be deliberate. Uh, you, you just have to look at the, the weight of how it does it. I think it does obscure its gold accounting. Um, I mean, if it wanted to get rid of these allegations that there's all sorts of strange things going on in the gold market, it could adopt a much more open approach. Why doesn't it do it? I don't know the answer, but it's a question. And again, as I made the point, and 42% is correct, 10 out of 10, why did the amount of unallocated gold rise by so much? Again, uh, well, no, why? Tell us. Um, and it is still increasing uh, month by month. The BIS published a summary balance sheet. You can't work out too much from the summary, but it is still increasing. Uh, not a massively, but it's increasing. And so at a time you know, when all this is going on, it does sound and it does look suspicious to me. Um, and I think it, you know, the question is really there. I think central banks are under pressure to supply gold to the main bullion markets at the moment. And if you're a gold investor and you've already got your gold, I think that's pretty good news. As a citizen of the West, I think it's probably very bad news because I think it means we're going to see some very unpleasant economic consequences. But all you can do in that situation, I think, is look after yourself. So... Uh, I hope that talk has uh, been relatively interested. Uh, it was something I had some trepidations about doing. It is, uh, as I said, I think I used the word dry earlier. I think arid is even better, but it's uh, quite, quite, uh, quite, quite a tough thing to go through. But if the gold price has been suppressed for the reasons I've suggested, then clearly um, you know, there's great support there for future gold price increases. And I think... This is true. The solution to Gibson paradox really does provide a completely logical explanation for why this suppression was, in my opinion, attempted. And you, know, you will form your own view, and I would encourage you to read and do your own research on, on anything. But uh, it took me a long time to be convinced. I first started investing in gold, I think, in 1999. Um, and that was partly because I couldn't work out what was going on in the general economy. Uh, and Mark Farber published a piece which I read, and that sort of led me towards thinking I'd look in gold. I then started reading a lot of stuff, and I think it probably took me another five years to start actually thinking, actually there might be something in this suppression argument. And then when I came across Reg Howe's work, the logic of it started to become quite compelling for me. Uh, 
as I said, I would just encourage all of you to do your own work and form your own opinion on it. But for me, I've been able to have a look at the BIS, and that, if you like, has been the last um, piece of the jigsaw. It has really convinced me uh, that there is something going on. And uh, all I can say is I'm very happy to hold gold and wish I had more. So thank you very much.